Hey everyone, welcome back to season five of In the Studio with Brad. And yes, that means somewhere we're we're start, starting to inch into as many seasons as Big Brother, Survivor, or Who Wants to Marry a Midget Millionaire. God help us all. So it's been an eventful full year, as I'm sure you're all aware, and I will get to that in a moment. But first, at the request of my darling wife. Yes, we have a lot of these. You, I'm sure you all, any of you tuning in from se previous seasons, remember those. Those of you who are smart are probably running screaming from the room pro proactively. But, oh, here we go. This is actually just something informational. So you can retain your sanity points. Apples are a member of the Rose family. Apples, along with pears, plums, cherries, and peaches, are all members of the rose family of plants. I did not know that. I just, yeah. And now you know. The more you know. Yeah, really. You can go ahead and try and work that meme into uh, what when it goes up on YouTube, okay? Oh, I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, what have I been working on? First off, when I heard that we were going to be doing AOR Grimm's Tooth Traps, I begged, borrowed, and steal, stole, and, um, you know, on, on bended knee to be allowed to do a portrait of, of course, everyone's favorite insane goblin, Grimm's Tooth. So that's one thing that I've done. I've been doing a lot of X crawl, some of which I will be able to put my hands on. This is all going to be from X-Crawl Classics Module 4, I believe, like the death of death in the world of tomorrow, something like this. So you have three orcs in really, really goofy looking retro spacesuits, and they're summoning space fish, I guess. I smile, I nod, I draw. This actually I just did as a piece of stock art to be used wherever uh, Matt needs an extra, you know, some extra art. And because, hey, cheesecake always sells. I know that's horribly sexist of me. And, you know, you can yell at Wall, Wall Street for that. Okay, now on a slightly more elevated level. This is my latest piece for Tales from a Magician's Skull for, I believe it's the Flight of the Marshman. I am extremely happy how this turned out, even though it took me about, oh, a week longer of intense labor to accomplish. But I think it was worth it. Marlene, yes, I know you're probably smiling right now if you... You're actually tuned in. Uh, that was ended up being a uh, early Christmas gift for Mar for my for a friend. Now, back to X call because I didn't have time to get these really organized in advance. I'm not sure exactly what's going on in here, but it's what an X crawler being attacked by a spirit boot. Yes, a spirit boot. Or as I like it called, a boo tea. <laughs> Why? Was, that was bad. What's that? <laughs> that was bad. Thank you. Thank you. Another X crawl piece. I, I had some fun with the, the various textures that I worked on. I'm not sure whether you can see this or not. And the villain of the piece, I guess this character is going to be x crawls first ongoing antagonistic character, Harley Danger. Okay. This is what the uh, Space Orcs picture looked like. Oops, wait a minute. I guess we do need to show these. Okay, never mind. Okay, I am not sure whether this one might not be... 
a leftover from last season. Does does anybody remember this piece? I don't I remember this... him. Okay. Well, it's a horror, but still. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm not looking at my monitor. I'm like looking at it in this tiny frame on OBS. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't I, remember I th her at all. I think this is a new one. Yeah, the, I, the gag was that she's a uh, spokesperson for Fang, and I should have gotten a printout of this one because, like, everywhere you look has the Fang Company logo. Don't think I showed this one off last season either. This actually is a slight reworking from a piece that was going to appear in the Pathfinder uh, version of X-Crawl. And then I just got really busy with uh, the last Age of Cthulhu book and it kind of went away. And when I was kind of digging through some files, I was like, ooh, hey Matt, do you want me to finish this? So there you go. Oops, the original of Grimm's Tooth. Every once in a while, just to uh, make sure that Matt is always confused with what I'm doing, I just knock out a piece of uh, stock art. So, a no, I have no clue where where this will eventually appear, but I was really happy with how it came out. Um, I think this was for the last Dark Tower, and I don't remember the details otherwise. I think that. Oh, yeah, there was a whole bunch of type that I just kind of actually typeset for that. Okay, I'm pretty sure these are all leftovers from last year. Yes. Okay, well, so. I mean, there's other stuff I have done in the past several months. I just uh, not sure where all of it is. Why? Because I'm horribly disorganized that way. So what else have I been working on? Um, at the request, actual request of uh, both Harley Stroh and Joseph, uh, I am doing one outside job for a new company called Witches Plea Games. Uh, they're a little bit notorious right now among the DCC community because he was uh, going to he was using some AI artwork before he uh, started his Kickstarter. The uh, but after he got kind of wind that how little the DCC art community likes AI artwork, he reached out to both myself and Stefan Pogue. And the one other artist whose name escapes me this very moment, you know, is like, hey, I want to hire you guys. So I'm doing some quarter pages for him. This is a an albino bugbear called the Judge. And I think he came out fairly well. And I have another illustration that I'm going to be working on this evening. I was going to work on some X crawl, but I'm just for once, I'm not feeling the X crawl love tonight. So I'm going to draw a very snazzy looking goblin named just a second I play my work reader. He is Kligian Tark, a sleazy goblin dressed in finery, preferably with a smarmy charm and conviving aspect to him. That sounds like it could be fun, don't you think, guys? So why don't we get to work? He likes to wear lots of jewelry, and the work order does specify that he has several facial piercings. So that's going to be really fun. So let's break out the, the pencil here. So while you're doing that, we do have a question uh, from the audience um, from okay. Commando Solo uh, saying, do you find a lot of AI art out there and do you worry about it in the long run? Um, I'm actually not that worried for one legal reason that I believe 
and you might want to check double check uh ai artwork automatically enters the public domain which is a pretty significant problem because that means that if somebody sees your artwork your some ai artwork in your book that they like they can just go ahead and use it and i think very quickly a lot of people are just going to be like and eh, no so it says um looking it up myself um all of the generative ai artworks you want um but you will not be pr protected under copyright law for AI mm -hmm. art. Yep. So, yeah. So I think you're going to find very quickly that, I mean, there's going to be some people who just don't care and they're like, you know what? I'm never going to make enough money off this. This is mostly just a fun thing. But any company that actually is interested in trying to make money isn't going to want to be producing artwork that's going to automatically enter the public domain. Yeah, basically the reason why it can't be um, copyrighted is that the copyright law really only pertains to people who have created it, not the, because like, you know, AI art is not a person creating the art. It is you're putting in words and a computer is doing it for you. So you exactly. can't, yeah, you can't actually say, oh, you know, I, I, this is my, my art piece. Well, uh, technically not. No, it isn't, you know. I mean, I can understand why some people are going to re use it, though. As I think I have talked before, the gaming industry or publishing industry in general is not exactly highly profitable. You know, I'm sure any of you who, anyone in the audience right now that is a, uh, has taken a step of publishing is like, yeah, if I didn't have an absolutely insane passion for this, I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. You know, I mean, if I were really smart, I would uh, get a job, at, you know, much more profitable job, say, in working out, I don't know. Uh, would you like a chalupa with that? <clears throat> <laughs> no, thank you, though, by the way. Uh, yeah, like, I can understand um, using AI art for your own uh like, I don't know, I have an idea of what something I want to look like, and I, like, I could kind of see it in a, I'm going to have the, the AR art create this character, this monster, this thing, based on, like, I can only describe it in words, I can't even, like, sketch it out, and kind of have an idea in, like, in physical form before, like, and kind of having it as almost like a reference in a way, mm -hmm. but yeah. I I don't I don't see it. I I can see it in that regard. I can also see it in the regard like um, I've known people who have used like Mid Journey or one of the other AI art creative things um, to basically make like a background image that is just super basic because mm -hmm. they either a can't make the art themselves. B can't take a picture and C don't really feel like paying for you know a, a picture or like a stock image or or whatever and they want it to be semi tailored to whatever they're doing like they've made it for like um UI like touch screen things so that like mm -hmm. they have like they could have this pretty it's mostly uh, the person that I I'm referencing has mostly used it in like churches or whatever where they have like the the screen saver i guess of their little touch screen for their sound sound systems or uh, uh control rooms before they hit the button it'll have like this generic christian themed you know cross on a mountain picture and they're not using it in any way to profit like they're not like profiting off of you know I made this thing for your touchscreen. It's just, I just wanted to make something that wasn't just a blank background with your logo yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah, that's... I was talking to an artist a few days ago 
you know, he sees a practical use in AI, for example, and we were using the example of a horse. You know, anybody who has ever tried to draw a horse knows they're incredibly complicated animals to try to draw. And sometimes you need a very specific pose. And he says, AI is good for stuff like that, where it's like, okay, I need a horse rearing on onto one leg. Okay. You might not be able to find, first off, you're not going to be able to go out to the, uh, you know, field and find some horse that is just going to be willing to stand up on one leg for you. And it's going to be, and I've, and I've had this problem, you know, trying to, you know, well, the, um, da, 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 the picture I did of, for the last issue of uh, Tales from the Magician's Skull, which had a character on horseback, I spent literally about two hours trying to find a good photo reference of a horse in that position. Well, that was, you know, from a purely uh, cold, you know, professional point of view, that was two hours of lost productivity time. Whereas I could have been like, Okay, type in a horse uh, about three quarters view, one leg up, one, you know, three leg, you know, one leg this angle, da, 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 da. and I could basic, and it would basically generate AI would generate me what usually they do, what like four options. Yeah, roughly that. You know, and I could then use that as a, then you could use that as a springboard for your actual artwork. You know, you're not actually using AI to actually create artwork that you're going to use. You're using it basically to generate reference material. Yeah, and I've done that um, where I was, I was like discussing uh, dreams. One of uh, one of my friends' groups has has Mid Journey uh, tied tied into their Discord channel, and. Um, like I was trying to describe to them this weird dream and we were all kind of we all got this idea well why don't we have like mid journey try to make what we saw in our dreams you hmm. know into art and it was kind of neat like the results that you can get from it from very vague description like I got Oh man, I I had this one dream where I had like blood soaking from the walls and it was like in this like looking it was like a, a a uh oh what's the term for it a low shot uh where it was like looking upwards like worm's at, eye. yeah worm's eye. yeah basically yeah it was a worm's eye view like looking up at this desk and like blood just coming down the wall and it was they it came up with some really creepy creepy pictures and it, it it was kind of neat because these are things like none of us are artists ourselves that like I like it because I can go well I even like I'm not trying to sell this but hey I'm having a hard time describing to you what I'm seeing in my brain so here right. I made this AI thing create this thing so that I can show it to you <laughs> hey there you go yeah Pony King says I have a horse mannequin. <laughs> but yeah, I I have kind of a complicated feeling about AI as far as that goes. Because I was actually commenting and pointing out to someone on Facebook, you know, as an artist, obviously. I want to make as much money as possible off illustration. Obviously, AI and I are not going to get along as far as that goes. But if I'm a small publisher, you know, I may be looking at, gee, I'm going to make, I'm going to maybe make, say, a thousand dollars in sales off of this product if I'm lucky. Okay. And I can use AI, mid-journey, whatever, and basically pay nothing for it, for the artwork. Or 
I can hire a bunch of artists and probably spend a thousand dollars just on the art budget. Now, which makes the better financial and fiscal sense? Oh, it a hundred percent makes makes more sense to do the AI, even if we don't like it. Um, like even if like as a whole the community doesn't like it, you know. Um, but. It, it's a it's a smart business move in a sense because like I think it's like a hundred and twenty dollars a year, uh to for the, like the the premium subscription of Mid Journey or whatever. Uh, sounds about right. It's, yeah, I... it's kind of like paying for a Photoshop suite or Adobe suite, <laughs> which I find annoyingly pricey for really no reason. Um, for the amount of users who use Adobe, $120 is ridiculous. Um, that's just me. <laughs> oh, no, I, I agree wholeheartedly, but unfortunately, I don't have much choice in the matter, and hey, yep. uh, Goodman pays for it anyhow. Yeah, I was about to say, even if, uh, even if, like, Joseph didn't pay for it, hey, I could write it off as a tax expense, because I literally need it for work. <laughs> yeah. Um... But the, um, I, I will say, and, and going back to this is probably going to sound absolutely terrible, and I've probably told this story before, um, but it was last season, so you guys have probably forgotten it by now. Um, but, uh, what's I... That? What's that? What's I'm, your name? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm nobody. <laughs> um... I hope my professor isn't listening, let me put it that way, because uh, I could not, for the life of me, I had to write a short story um, for uh, a class in in the last my last semester of school, which, by the way, I am officially graduated, I have the, the paper, Yay. I have the paper that tells people that I'm not worth what they're paying me. Anyway, <laughs> I, um... I, I used ChatGBT because this was, like, when it was relatively new. Uh, it wasn't, like, you know, fully fledged fledged out the way, uh, you know, the way it is now where it's yeah. taken over the entire internet, it seems. But, um, but I was, I could not for the life of me come up with anything for this prompt that we were doing. It was a cool prompt. Like, we had to, we were basically having to write, um... A, a fictional story about artifacts and like it was for archaeology and basically you know using whatever there were certain guidelines and I was just having such a hard time because I did not I did not uh go like when I was doing the the art pieces or the the art like I was looking at the artifacts and these like sculptures and and all of these different things that we all chose I was like this is so much easier to research than it is to write about for me and I was just I could not do it I I'm usually pretty good with creative writing but I just couldn't do it so I literally got on chat GBT and I said okay tell me tell me a short story uh, from the viewpoint of this kind of character in this time period and make sure that it has references to blank, 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 and blank. And I took that and I did not copy paste, uh, any of it. I just used it clearly as reference. I was like, I can't figure out how to start this. So I looked at it and like, if you look at AI, like written things, it is, it doesn't have the nuances of the language. So it's going to be kind of crap. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah, so it's very awkward, and it's, it like, they don't word things properly because it, it doesn't understand uh, the the actual English language. <laughs> um, so it... Yeah, not least. Yeah, so, like, I, I literally just had it up on my second monitor, and I, I looked at it. I said, okay, I see where this story is going, and I took that story, and I rewrote it. And so it was, it was my like peace in the end but it was it was chat gbt that that created it in a sense like they they did the story idea all i did was just write it <laughs> that doesn't seem that really terribly dissimilar from you know what they do in hollywood that there's like one big really successful game movie and all of a sudden every other studio out there is producing basically lookalikes <clears throat> DC. <clears throat> What's that? DC. Yeah. 
they're just now getting with the trend that has already passed of multiverses, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I remember when I heard what they were trying to do with uh, both the Justice League movie and the Suicide Squad movie, and it's like, wait a minute, no, no, you don't introduce all these characters in one movie and then spin backwards. Yeah. You know, you do like, you know, Marvel did, you introduce these characters in their own movies, you get them established so that the audiences care about them, and then you throw them all in together. Yeah. It didn't seem like it was that radical of a concept, but obviously it was more than the people at Warner Brothers could figure out. Yeah, it's really frustrating because I think, like, Warner Brothers, uh, the comics alone, uh, they're sitting on, like, the perfect parallel to, like, Endgame and whatnot with their Blackest Night, Brightest Day story. And mm -hmm. I've had this idea for years, and I've been thinking about making screenplays of it just for my own, you know, interest in it. <laughs> just, I, I kind of want to do it, uh, but it's like the Blackest Night, Brightest Day storyline is literally in-game for DC. And mm -hmm. it is awesome, but they screwed up so badly with the original Green Lantern, I don't think anybody wants to do that, wants to touch that with a no, tip pole. No, I noticed... They've been saying for years now that they're going to be doing a uh, Green Lantern course TV show, but I think that's dead. And I mean, all the casting that I saw for it's like, did you guys even bother reading the Wikipedia page about the char yeah. these characters? Yeah, it's it's frustrating. I I am I'm over superheroes. I love superheroes. Like I'm a big comic book nerd, but like I I'm over superheroes now. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um I think the last superhero actual superhero show movie or show that I watched was do 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 I wanna say Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, that's fair. Um I think I can honestly say the same for me. I think that might have been the last one I watched too, and I haven't seen anything I haven't seen anything since, because I watched Loki and WandaVision before that, which, by the way, I, I am still so angry at Disney, because you should never ever make a standalone movie that's going to be in theaters and have it tied to a show where people have to watch. Like, you don't necessarily have to watch WandaVision to understand, you know, the Doctor Strange movie, the second one, but it but helps. It, yeah. You're going to be completely lost as to why, you know, Wanda is insane. <laughs> yeah but that's that's a whole nother thing uh that's this greed um but uh commando does make a good point uh it was so bad that in the deadpool movie uh ryan <laughs> yeah <laughs> ryan went reynolds back went back and killed him yes i love it <laughs> now if there's any upcoming superhero movies that i do want to see it's going to be deadpool 3 simply because I don't know. I mean, it might be interesting to see what happens with when Jay, when uh, Gunn starts to uh, really take over. You know, if there's anyone who I think besides Kevin Feige that can do this, it's going to be him. I just realized, I take it back, the last superhero movie I watched was The Batman. You know, I haven't even gotten around to watching it yet. It's, just because It's good. That's what I have heard. Jess has watched it a couple of times. Just, uh, I have not been in the headspace to attack a three-hour detective movie. I was gonna say, it's it's long. <laughs> that's the only, that's the only, the only downside to that movie is that it might be just a little too long, but, um, that's a whole nother, like, god, I could talk about that forever. It feels like blockbuster movies are constantly gaining time. Yeah. Like, it seems like, especially since the pandemic, where we all kind of had to stay at home, it kind of feels like they're trying to make up 
and make us, in a sense, like, mark up the price of tickets because, you know, if we make a three-hour movie, it's going to cost this much for people to go see it, so theaters have to up the prices, and it kind of feels like it's perpetuating this, like, we're going to get four-hour-long movies, and, like, who the heck has time to sit around for four hours nowadays? Um, show of hands? Yeah, I didn't think uh, so. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, well, I mean, it's really also relevant to me or telling to me. Uh, just a few days ago, I kind of uh, wanted to see uh, the Steven, Sp Steven Spielberg's first real movie, Duel, which is only like 80 minutes, 80, maybe 90 minutes, because it was like a made for TV movie. And it's like, this tells a complete story gripping as mm, expletively deleted so that YouTube does not demonetize us and also that so Joseph doesn't get pissed off at me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and it was like 90 minutes when they actually got, when it became such a success, they actually had to pad it out a little bit so it was long enough to qualify for, to make it into a full-blown theatrical release. But it was like maybe 90 minutes and that was including all the credits and and such. Yeah. You know. Like, and I like, I feel like movies do such... Uh, I, I think movies can do such a good job at telling a succinct story in, you know, at, at two hours tops. Like, yeah. two hours is fine. I think three hours gets a little much. And it, it it's like, why... I, I think my, my issue with most three-hour movies that I've seen is, like, why are you spending so much time on padding? Like, you're just padding it out for no reason. Um, and, well, they're padding it out so that they can, uh, you know, yeah, they can justify paying a lot more. Remember, yeah. I mean, why do you think they uh, padded out uh, the last Harry Potter movie to be two movies? Yeah, I didn't even, you know. I, I didn't watch those in the theaters, like, I, I had watched, like, every Harry Potter movie up until the sixth one, and, like, in the sixth one, because it was, like, a family thing, because it came out around Christmas, um, and it was the same thing when the Star Wars, like, the newer Star Wars movies came out, we didn't like them, but we watched them because it was, like, our family tradition, you know, mm -hmm. because my brother and I didn't live with our parents anymore, to get together before, like, the actual Christmas stuff where we see all of the family, we would right. all go out to the movies. And we got to the sixth Harry Potter movie, and all four of us were just like, mm. yeah, no, that wasn't good. You want to skip the next one? <laughs> yeah. I don't even remember what we went and saw instead. But... Care Bear is the reboot. Care what do you think? Bear? Yeah. Care Bears, the grim, grit, gritty reboot. I actually want to see, I would actually want to see that. Yeah, that would probably be fun. Also, I just realized that somewhere along the line, I missed that uh, your wife asked for a random joker fact. Oops, sorry, hon. That's, that's on me. <laughs> oh, okay. Ooh, here we go. Oh, neat. Here we go. This is one for all the mythology buffs. In Greek mythology, fall is associated with the story of Persephone, the queen of the underworld. She spends half the year in the underworld, leading to the changing seasons. I knew that. Did you know that? I feel like I probably knew that a long time ago. <laughs> oh. Actually, that kind of segues into a fun bit that Jess and I have been watching recently. It's a uh, show, Canadian, uh, I guess you could call it a children's show, called The Class of, Tit Class of the Titans. And it is a world of fun. It's uh, seven teenagers who are all descendants of the classical Greek 
uh, heroes. And they are kind of bound together because Kronos, who is, if anyone who knows their Greek mythology, was not a nice person, has escaped and wants to destroy the world because, you know, he's a villain. You know, isn't that what villains are required to do, to want to do? But there is Jason, who is the reincarnation of Jason of the Argonauts. Uh, Harry, who is Hercules's... Oh, let me see here. I guess that makes you my great, 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 great grandson. Yes, Hercules is a character on the show, and he is this 50s balding guy who you can tell is basically desperately trying to hold on to his uh, youth. And yes, he is. Yeah, it's like, oh, God, that's Hercules, isn't it? I didn't want to see Hercules running around in a, in a white beater and boxer shorts. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You can you can ask Jess if you don't believe me. Oh, that's funny. Uh, um, Achilles is uh, one of Archie, who is Achilles' descendant. Uh, Atlanta, who is basically the reincarnation of Artemis. Uh, Teresa, who is a gender swap version of Thesis, uh, the guy, the uh, Greek hero that killed the Minotaur, and. Odie, who is a uh, a great 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 uh, of Ulysses slash Odysseus, the Trojan horse guy, and finally Narcissus or Neil, who is the uh, an ancestor of uh, or descendant of uh, Narcissus, the I am so beautiful of the Greek gods. <laughs> it's hilarious. It actually uh, really shows that the writers. Did have uh, done more than just reading the Wikipedia for uh, Greek mythology, and some of the dialogue is just hilarious. Oh, that's great! I'll have to check that uh, out. By about the fifth or sixth episode, you know when something weird happens, it's like Cronus. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know they're they're not even surprised that he's the bad guy of the episode. Mm -hmm. It's like eh, okay, yeah. Let's get it. Let's get, take care of this. So, do 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 do. Hold on, I got just got to read through some script here. Hmm. His ears and pe face pierced by gold hoops. Fun. Okay, I can do that. So, um, it, it's funny that, that you brought that up because, uh, Jess, like, as you were, as you were saying the title, she was hitting enter on her keyboard to mention it in chat. <laughs> mm hmm Yeah. We're on season three and we're still like, I mean, they're actually pl pulling some stuff out of uh, Greek mythology that I had forgotten about and I'm. I like to think that I'm pretty good at this stuff. So. And like I said, some of the dialogue, some of the dialogue is utterly hilarious. It's available for streaming, I believe, on Amazon Prime, Tubi, and Filmrise. Oh, nice. Yeah. And no, I'm not getting a... Uh, royalty from uh, from any of those streaming services unfortunately hashtag not sponsored <laughs> okay i think this guy is just about done so i will send him to the client In case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm just going to make that area black where I put the X's. But that's just so I, as kind of a reminder to myself. I learned that from uh, yay back in the day when I was going to become a cartoon, 
trying and try and become a uh, comic book artist. So what am I working on now? So I think this is basically going to be a sketch pen tonight, guys. Just don't worry, by next week we will be back to our normal fun. I don't see anything wrong with uh, doing some sketching. So, as I mentioned before, and probably most of you already know, we're going to be the next OAR book or collection of books is going to be reprints of the old Grimm's Tooth books. But Matt asked me if I would be willing to do a table contents. So, I am doing exactly that. Yeah, that's one inch. Hold on. That's so basically this will be a tape an image that will run around. And actually, no, that's kind of I I just wasted a few moments time because what I usually do when I do images like this, rather than try to draw everything, what I will do is I will do a really tight sketch of one half. And then I will ink it, of course, obviously. And then what I do, I'll do is I'll put it in, drop it into Photoshop and I'll basically, you know, flip it so that each side is perfectly symmetrical to the other. It's probably technically cheating, but it also gives me the freedom to spend a little bit more time on making the one the illustration very, very detailed without taking, you know, literally weeks. Commando Solo says that you could literally sit there and draw circles for two hours if you wanted and he'd be go he'd be okay. Who, who said that? Commando Solo. <laughs> okay, let me, what's right? I would probably get kind of bored watching that. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Not really sure a stick of dynamite is terribly appropriate for a fantasy game. But hey, it'll kill the characters, so it's appropriate for Grimm's food. What do you think, guys? I feel like there's some weird traps in Grim Tooths that are that are not quite fantasy. Hmm. I know there's a whole section in one of the books that's like sci-fi traps, but I know that in some of the like normal room traps there were some ones that are like there's no way that this is you know this has got to be you know technically fantasy related <laughs> these seem too modern <laughs> yeah well that's grim truth never really uh you know concerned itself with being too terribly tight to the rules you know oh for sure Speaking of, I have to uh, shamelessly plug this for all of our watchers out there. If you have not already, um, I will get the, the link up for you, um, but if you have not already signed up for the Grimtooth's Trap Backer Kit uh, to get notified for when it starts, I have set a link down below for you to see it. Okay, so I've got spikes. Uh, dynamite, spike traps, hammers, severed arms, uh, poison goblets, uh, barrels probably full of gunpowder, 
bear traps, bombs, swords, skulls, knives, uh, bloody springs. Um, any other ideas, guys? We got some. We got some room yet. You know. Think of this as crowdsour crowdsourcing the artwork. You could do like um uh a suit of a suit of armor in a in a way or not like a suit of armor but like a piece of armor like a bracer or uh a helmet or something that's been dinged up or pierced. Okay, we can do that. I may or may not have been thinking about one of the traps that was featured on uh, last week's show, the Magnetic Bracers. <laughs> uh, Pony King says fireballs. Okay. Oh, there we go. Nothing quite says a, a set of Grimm's Tooth uh, greaves quite like uh, spikes along the inside of the greaves, so Oh, nice, uh, Greaves, you know, these are really to my arm. What do you think, guys? I, okay. I believe Grimtooth would love it. I'm trying to figure out how to do a fireball in a picture like this. Actually, I'm not sure I can do a fireball. Sorry, Pony King. Part of this was already approved by Matt, so I am I can embellish, but I can't get rid of too much stuff. You know? Excuse me. Sorry, folks. I don't know how possible it would be in a, uh, like when you, when you touch it up and, and ink it out, how possible it would be to, to do that little, like, effect that you have on top of the spike trap and, like, kind of make it, like, smoke almost, like something's burning in the background. <laughs> This shouldn't be too hard. I don't know how how dark smoke has to uh, how how dark and light the smoke has to be to contrast it against the traps is more what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay, so I would say that is good enough to send to Matt for final approval. Okay. Okay. So do you have a favorite trap that you've had to start illustrating yet? No, uh, most, almost all the uh, traps are going to be reprints from the original books. Oh, probably okay. by Steve Crompton. Simply because most of them are more diagram oriented. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the most part, I think the Grimm's Tooth crowd likes Crompton's artwork. I mean, I do. I just, I didn't know if some of them were going to be, like, I don't I don't know, how do I put this? Like, some of the traps don't have pictures in, in the book, so I didn't know if maybe we were going to give it uh, a semi-Dungeon Denizens feel, uh, where, like, you know, some of the traps that don't have pictures might have uh, pictures that you guys draw. I think a lot of them are simply so complicated that they would be almost impossible to illustrate. <laughs> That's fair. You know. You know what? I think I am going to go back to my flame from earlier today when I was really kind of like, oh, crud. I've got Zoom tonight. 
I think I'm just going to try and start knocking out a piece of clip art that can just be dropped in pretty much anywhere. Hold on. The point of making a uh, stock art is basically to make it as usable as possible in any specific or or any variety of areas. For example, this is going to be a pile of treasure, probably with like a sword sticking out of it, maybe a skull, yada, yada, yada. You get the idea. So I'm going to draw a bunch of circles. That'll be coins. circles that I can detail to make look like giant pearls. Also, oh, you... uh, no, this is just some clip art that uh, that Brad is is creating on the fly. Yeah, because someone didn't uh, do a very good job of getting organized before. It's like, oh crud, I've got a. You know, in the, in the studio with Brad, season five in about uh, an hour and a half. Oops. Did Peter Mullen, I take it? Hi, Peter. So do you have a, like, treasure-themed uh, clip art booklet? Because I know, like, excuse me, I just ate. Um, a piece of candy, and now it's stuck to the roof of my mouth. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, uh, I know, like, you've got zombies and, like, some mythical creature ones and things like that. Do you have ones that are just, like, here's a collection of a bunch of different kinds of treasure? Um, actually, I don't think I do. Um, I probably should. I know, uh, Will McOsland has several such uh, collections available out through his Outland Arts uh, company. I generally don't do too much clip art anymore, you know, other than in you know, like times like this where it's like, uh, I need to figure out something to do for the next hour or so. NPI, uh, NPL illustration says, sounds like it's time for an on-stream random generator with chat. <laughs> oh, sorry. I kind of got distracted trying to figure out what that mm, I'm doing. It's okay. Uh. I got distracted <laughs> as well, thinking about, hmm, do I have all the things that I need? <laughs> do I have everything ready for the next show? Yeah. I swear I know what I'm doing. I also just had a freak out moment of was I clocked in or not. Uh, clocking in is considered a good thing, by the way. Y yeah. You know, sometimes I forget. Just says Brad's secretary has been lacking in getting new bundles done for clip art. <laughs> well, we have been a bit distracted lately. It happens. Yeah. Um. Oh, Pooh. I had something I was going to ask. And now I've forgotten. Oh, now I remember. So... You said you wanted to be a comic book artist back in the day. Yay, back in the day, yeah. What was, um, because I think we've talked about what your inspiration was for that, but what, what were you wanting to, uh, like, was there a certain, 
uh, comic book series or company that you, you wanted to actually draw for? Um, I like to think that I was uh, realistic enough about it, that it was like whoever's willing to, you know, take a chance on me, you know, I'll go ahead and work for them. I mean, I submitted to uh, First Comics, DC, Marvel, uh, First Comics. I think I already mentioned First. I'm sorry. I mentioned, I, I sent out a, like the same uh, submission to like four different companies and got such a wide array of ridiculous responses back that it, it kind of started souring me. I mean, I had one company that shall remain unnamed that liked my storytelling, like how I laid out my pages, but they didn't like my actual drawing skills. The same, another company with the exact same submission liked my artwork, but didn't like my storytelling. And then shortly after that, two of the uh, comic book artists that I admired the most both passed away basically when, within about two months of each other. And I'm like, uh, I'm only like 19 years old, and this guy worked himself by, to death by the time he was 28 doing this stuff. I'm not sure that's a real good, uh, that's not a career path I really want to pursue on anymore all of a sudden. Yeah, really. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Peter wants to know who the artists were. Um, Gene Day, that was the one guy that uh, died when he was 28, and Don Newton. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, Gene Day's artwork from uh, the early run of Master of Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. You know, and I also started finding out exactly how much I would be making as an as a comic book artist, and that's like, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so six hundred dollars a page, but I have to divide that up evenly between six people or more, and it's I'm generally only going to be able to produce maybe one page of artwork a day if I'm good, if I really am have a good head of steam going. That didn't translate to a very uh, encouraging, you know, rate of pay. You know? Yeah. Especially considering you, considering you basically you almost had to live in, the, in New York City at that time. And I'm like, so I'm going to be making maybe after taxes $60 a day. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely a hmm. I don't know if it's worth it. <laughs> exactly. So I just kind of like. You know, then you hear you start hearing of the horror stories about how the companies treat some of the artists. And it's like, wow, um, geez. No, 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 no. Not, just not, you know, that's why I kind of abandoned my uh, goals of wanting to be a comic book artist. And uh, I was going to become an art teacher. And then somehow I got shanghai into the gaming industry. You know, which is, you know, so much more profitable at you know,
Well, uh, to lighten the mood from depressing comic book artists uh, to <laughs> something uh, that will probably make us lose our sanity just as much, uh, Jess has redeemed another random Joker fact. Okay. Do, 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 do. Oh, this is one of her big ones. You found a few few long ones. So I'm not sure what we're going to be. Oh, here we go. Halloween is the second largest commercial holiday in the U.S. It is considered a lower cost holiday, but most people spent around $90 on decorations, candy, and co costumes. Excuse me. In 2019, the total was about $8.8 billion spent on Halloween merchandise. Because who doesn't love ha decorating for Halloween? Um, probably any ex-employee of Spirit Halloween. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Just as today, brought to you by Fallen Halloween Fun Facts. Yeah, really. I have a friend who manages a Spirit Halloween out in Santa Cruz. and I mean, that sounds like it would be the ideal job, but I think she's getting a little bit tired of, well, um, today was supposed to be my day off and I had five people scheduled, you know, to cover this shift at the store and uh, nobody showed up for work. You need to come in and cover everyone's shift. About three weeks ago, yeah, it was supposed to be her day off and none none of the people that she had assigned to work that day showed up for work. I would be just a little bit peeved. I would be too. I guess she says it's uh, hell on wheels for wrecking up overtime. But I'm getting. I'm going to guess that her wife is getting a little bit tired of this. Yeah. You know, Sarah is probably like, "How soon can November first touch it? arrive?" Except that she, since she's a manager, she's going to have to be be in charge of shutting down the store too. So Sarah is probably be more along the lines of, you know, number November fourth can't come soon enough. Yeah, that's always the part that kind of sucks. On the other hand, I would still rather do that. And Jess can tell you about this. We uh, had to pop into one of those, uh, like, like Bath and Body Works stores. Uh, this was like a couple weeks before Thanksgiving the one year. Okay, keep this in keep this in mind because they were already playing their one Christmas CD that they were pushing, which was only 12 songs. And that was all they were allowed to listen to. And this was like six weeks before Christmas. That just makes me angry. Oh, she that poor girl behind the counter was already to the point where she couldn't even pretend that she was excited to be listening to this stuff. It's like, yeah, I've only got another six weeks of this. I'm sorry, ma'am. Your life must be hell. I think I actually said that to her. I can't stand Christmas music anymore because of the years that I spent doing my time as a retail worker. Uh, never again. I don't want to go back. You can't make me go back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and something that kind of annoys the living daylights out of me, there was a musical pirate site that I went... I used to go to, and it's now long gone. And it had a ho a holiday music section, okay? So, of course, it had, you know, a fair number of Halloween stuff. And, it, of course, it had Christmas stuff. 
and they would kind of change it up, you know, according to the uh, hol appropriate holiday season. There was like 17 pages of different Christmas albums. So you can imagine. You can imagine, I mean, what, how much Christmas music that actually translates to out there that's floating around the world. But we get the same, what, 10 songs? I don't know what you're talking about. It's great. We should be thankful for, for all of the Mariah Carey renditions we hear. <laughs> yeah there's like maybe five christmas songs that i actually like look forward to hearing yeah well of course the grinch that's yeah. the best one yeah but yeah, the the list gets awfully short after that. Now, ironically, English heavy metal group Slade did a Christmas song that is like, what? This is incredible. This is great. It's like an Irish. It's like an English Irish, you know, pub song, that happens to be a Christmas song. I guess it ended up being their biggest all-time hit. But. Oh. In, in PO Illustration says, I don't know. I used to not be able to hear it anymore come December. It's like I've been desensitized by Christmas music. What's Man. that? I'm sorry. Uh, NP NPO illustration says, I don't know. I used to be, I used to not be able to hear anymore come December. Like I've desensit, I've been desensitized by Christmas music. Man, I am jealous. <laughs> I do understand that the the restaurant that I worked at for many years, uh, starting December first, and sometimes actually no. Sometimes, like, the day after uh, Thanksgiving, but one year, they actually started it before Halloween. It was nothing but Christmas music. Yeesh. And that was an utter nightmare. They, did th they only did that one year because I think they got too many complaints. Oh, I don't blame them. Like, I don't blame the patrons complaining about it <laughs> at all. I, uh, I would get... So I, I would get in trouble with upper management, but when I was the manager at a shoe store in a mall, uh, if I was on shift, we did not play Christmas music. Like, I didn't care what time of year it was. Uh, I, I didn't care that it was December, like mid-December. Uh-uh. There's Christmas music blaring outside in, you know, in the halls of the mall. We don't need to. We don't need to subject ourselves to having to listen to double Christmas music, especially if you're <laughs> close to the front gates of uh, of the store. So I yeah. never put on Christmas music. Like I would change the station if I was on duty and like my boss wasn't there that day, and mm -hmm. like the manager after me. Like I remember so many of my like uh, underlings would be like, "Oh God, dang it, Elena's not closing tonight. <laughs> that means we have to listen to Christmas music." Now that I have escaped uh, the hellscape of retail, um, I, I, I do listen to one set of Christmas music every year, probably to the detriment of anybody who is in anywhere near me during the time, but I have found a playlist on YouTube of okay. all of the Croco Christmas songs from Ren and Stimpy. I'm sorry, the what, what Christmas? Croco Christmas, the, their Christmas special. Oh, I think I'm familiar with that. Um, it's great, and, um, 
I I have gotten complaints about it because I will listen to that playlist on repeat while I'm wrapping presents. And it's the only time I listen to Christmas music. And it's the only Christmas music I listen to because I hate it. I hate it so much. I take that back. I listen to some Christmas carols, but that's mainly because most of them are in a minor key. And I really like minor key. Yeah. Yeah, I usually don't mind, like, you know, like that last week before Christmas. It's like, okay, you know, it's, you know. I'm not that much of a Grinch that, but come on, early November, you know, back into October. We we haven't even put away the Halloween decorations yet. Oh, uh, the local Coles already has all its Christmas stuff out already. Oh, I know. It gets, it's, it's sooner and sooner every year because Christmas is more profitable than Halloween. Which I think is a load of poop. Yes, I'm just not a big fan of the forced sentimentality. Uh, like it's hard for me to dislike the Pogues version of Christmas, of a Christmas song, because for God's sakes, it's the Pogues, you know. Yeah. You know, it's you know you hear that song. It's like, how did they get them sober enough to actually get into the co- recording studio and actually record the song all at the same time? You know. That's that's almost a Christmas miracle, kids. <laughs> yeah, um I think I think I wouldn't hate Christmas so much if like it wasn't, you know, shoved down your throat that, you know, it it seems like the meaning of Christmas is how much you spend on people. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, I, I, I don't know, I've just become jaded, and I, I feel like that's the, the poor college student still inside of me. <laughs> it's like, I can't afford to get anybody presents, but I feel like I must. Mm-hmm. And yet here we are talking about Christmas in October. Right. But to be fair, we're raging about Christmas in October, so. (laughs) So NPL says that the best one I have is a Swedish album, uh, reggae Christmas music based on traditional psalms and quote-unquote red union songs, the uh, weirdest combination and so far from the stuff we had at work. (laughs) There we go, yeah. Yeah, if it's something that I go like, this is Christmas music. I will probably be much closer to giving it a pass. Yeah. Um, like I said, my slave that's like, you know, is essentially a uh, English drinking song. Yeah. Uh, who is it? Within Temptation, I think, has like, uh, we're going to have a gothic Christmas. <laughs> and it's like, it's it's great. <laughs> I remember listening to that in middle school with uh with a friend of mine. Goth Christmas music, that's a concept. Now one uh tradition that we always always have every year, we spend at least one evening, uh usually after uh we've listened to some standard Christmas music, we'll break out we'll jump over uh to YouTube and start listening to the Lovecrafting Love Tat. Love crafty and the Christmas stuff, of which there is a scary amount. That's awesome. You know, because nothing says Christmas quite like a song about da, da, the the uh, red brain me go do do had a very shiny brain. <laughs> um, my family and I make uh make funny jokes uh to the tune of christmas songs like i have this knife that's like five six inch blade or something and so my um my aunt started calling it the christmas shiv and so we started singing oh christmas shiv oh christmas shiv your blade is stabby and shiny You cut up all our boxes so we can have our presents now. <laughs> it's like we none of it rhymes. We don't care. We're just making it to the tune. And it's right. just it's so dumb and I love it. 
<laughs> oh yeah. As long as you can make you can fit it to the tune, that's close enough. I can't wait for your Christmas shiv to be demonetized on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think that is detailed enough of a sketch, and what time is it? 8.25, so got a couple more minutes this week, so I think I'm going to try to start on one of the other sketches for Witch's Plea. Did I do what I think I did? Hold on just a second, guys. I am horribly disorganized here. Oh. No, the devil was. This is also a great way. Doing uh, the stock art kind of stuff is also a good way to get rid of, take care of scraps. Because you always end up with, you know, like this, well, like this. You know, something like that, you know, but it's too, too small to do any real, any normal artwork with. So, let's see here. MPL says it sounds like it's time for a sketch of the Christmas shoe. <laughs> Hold on just a second, guys. I'm going to inflict something on you. I'm not sure what. Oh, dear. Okay, I don't, I think this is just trivia. Oh. So, we haven't okay. run into a joke tonight. Shh. <laughs> okay, the harvest moon was the nearest full moon to the autumn equinox. The light of the full moon would allow farmers to work later into the evening to harvest their crops. Ah. Gosh. Are you sure this is in the studio with Brad? I haven't heard it. I haven't seen any jokes that made me want to, uh, you know, just run screaming from the room or, you know, break out the uh, uh, book of matches yet. You know, there's something wrong here. Yeah. Are all the jokes at the bottom? Did you shuffle it good enough? Here. Let's test. Okay, you asked for it. <laughs> Why are frogs always so happy? I don't know, Brad. Why? They eat whatever bugs them. I don't pump. <laughs> Feel free to insert uh, drum roll noises after that one, okay? Oh, I can. Thank you. I'm excited. So many editing things. Oh. Man, a Commando Solo has a, has a joke for us. Okay. What do mermaids wash their tails with? Hide. Oh, yeah, see, you've heard this one before. I hadn't. <laughs> I think I'm a member of the uh, Facebook group that uh, posted that one. And unfortunately, I don't think I'm joking here. Believe it or not, there is a Facebook page just for dad jokes i need to be a part of this facebook page it's called dad jokes oh man uh ask jess really nicely and i'm sure she can send you the link please peas and thank you Bobo the magic one has a good one too. I thought the dryer was shrinking my clothes. Turns out it was the refrigerator all along. Hmm. <laughs> I do understand that. Mine's the uh, pumpkin cake that I got recently from the store. Oof. 
I made a mistake. Thank you, Jess. She sent me an invite. Before I can forget, um, as some of you are aware, <clears throat> or at least probably most all of you are aware, uh, with Jess's health care problems the past year, we ended up starting a and doing a GoFundMe of which many people who I think are probably uh, regular viewers here uh, contributed, and I want to thank all of you. It has been an immense boon to us trying to get back on our feet financially. Though, unfortunately, it's turning out that, you know, we still need a tie bit more, but I will talk about that some other time. Because the uh, insurance companies in Ohio are awful about actually, like, you know, being willing to do anything to help people who are, you know, paying into the insurance industry. But... For anyone who is curious, Jess is getting better. The recovery is taking a little bit longer than I think we anticipated, but she is getting a little bit stronger every day. She is happy to be home because after nine months of at a nursing home, either a nursing home or at a hospital, you know, even the most drab of little hot. Houses looks really, really good. And I'm sure she's happy to have food that isn't what they served. Uh, yeah. We had uh, barbecue chicken chunks and this ridiculous cornbread that she found on a video for, for YouTube. It's cornbread your basic Jiffy cornbread, an entire can of cheese Whiz, and three eggs, and it is heavy, but oh my god, does it taste good. That sounds delightfully disgusting. Oh no, it's much better. You don't actually taste the cheese Whiz, but you know how cornbread can be like really kind of dry, and mm -hmm. mm, this is not that cornbread. Ooh. So, I mean, it's very much become my favorite, my favorite cornbread. I'm not normally a big cornbread person, uh, but there's sometimes I'll go to a restaurant that has cornbread and it'll surprise me because it's like buttery and whatnot. Mm hmm I've realized that it has to be like sweet cornbread. Yeah, this isn't actually a sweet cornbread. That's the funny thing. You know, I mean, it's it's your basic cornbread just with cheese added. Excuse me. NPO says, I, I don't think I've had cornbread other than, like, tortilla. Mm, technically a cornbread, but isn't... <laughs> Um, so cornbread is, is made like with, uh, tortillas, uh, where it's made with cornmeal. Um, but it's kind of like, um, if you've ever seen like an American, cause you're, you're Swede. Um, like if you've ever seen like American biscuits or, or whatever, they tend to kind of be like that. Sometimes they come in like muffin shapes or they'll be made in like a, a big pan and cut up. Um. That's how I, we usually do it. Yeah. That's how my mom normally does it. Um, but like... I don't, it's like a, a cornbread, like a cake almost, but made out of cornmeal is kind of like the texture. I would say it's like a dry cake in its texture, right? Yeah. That's why I think you would like this cornbread. It is not dry. It is more like, you know, it's more the moistness of a, of a pretty decent cake. Oh. Without yeah. being the, like, oh my God, you know. You know, how much sugar am I pumping into my system? Yeah. 
Uh, Jess shared the, the recipe in chat, so I'm going to have to screenshot that for later. Okay. Yeah, like I said, it's it's dirt simple. It's basically three ingredients. <laughs> and P.O. said, did I just mortally insult all of chat? No. No, you mortally insulted Southerners in chat. Um... <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, you didn't. Um, like, cornbread is is a very... I feel like it's a very, very American thing. I I don't know... Uh, I, I don't know many other cultures that do, like, cornbread, like, at least the way I've always had it. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a international cuisine that you... Any international cuisine that even uses corn? Um, Spanish uses a lot of corn for like their tortillas, and they they use um, uh, cornmeal in. I, I guess they might make cornbread the way we do, but like I know like cornmeal is used in tortillas. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, like corn tortillas are pretty pretty popular. Commando Solo, see, I'm a terrible Southerner. Uh, I don't know if you can tell by my accent, um, but I grew up in the South, and I hate cornbread. I hate grits. And uh, there was something else. What was the other thing that was super Southern that I don't really like? How um, many? Okra? Okra. Yeah, I hate okra. You can't get me to eat okra at all. That stuff's nasty. I don't think I've ever seen okra that was made in a way that I'd be like... Uh, didn't make me want to reach for a uh, crossing to holy water. <laughs> That's fair. I was just thinking, I don't think I've ever seen okra that wasn't fried. <laughs> it's kind of like kale. I'm sure there is a good way to make kale. I've yet to discover it. I have only ever seen kale as like a pretty cover for like a platter of vegetables. Like, it's just the, the scenery that you put the rest of your vegetables on for, like, a, <laughs> like one of those cocktail things. You know, you got a thing of ranch in the center, you got your kale sprouting around inside of it, and then you've got, like, your carrots and broccoli and cauliflower and tomatoes. Like, all of that surrounding it, but you never touch the kale. The kale is never touched. <laughs> Also, apparently, according to uh, Bobo the Magic One, Japan puts corn on their pizza. Oh, that's right. I did see that. that and I thought that looked very, very strange. I would eat it. I also saw a pizza that has, like, pickles on it, so I, I would eat that. Um, Actually, we had a pizza with pickles on it just the other day. A uh, cheeseburger pizza, of all things. And was it good? Yes, it was. Ooh. I, must I try had this. a, uh, I had my doubts, and Jess was like, "Just go ahead and try it." Now it has, you know, it has to be a specific type of pizza. I don't think pepperoni and pickles would work well. But yeah, this was a cheeseburger pizza with like ground beef and cheddar cheese instead of mozzarella, Ooh. and onions and. Uh, tomato slices. Mm, that does sound good. There's a um a restaurant near me that does um different kinds of ramen, and they have like a cheeseburger ramen. And I'm tempted to try it, but I haven't yet, just because I fell in love with the um show you. Oh, I'm going to butcher the name of it. Kuntatsu, I think, is what it is. Um, and it's uh, it's like this braised pork with like this certain kind of it's a certain kind of sauce that I can't remember that's on the pork, um, mm. but it has like corn, uh, spring onions, half of a hard boiled egg, and um, uh, a little slice of seaweed in it and it is delicious and i love it and now i gotta go and try the other flavors of ramen that they have yeah yeah we us stupid americans we eat ramen way the way wrong you know i mean the way we eat ramen is kind of like if you were to eat a plate of spaghetti 
oh, don't worry about that sauce or any meat sauce or any veggies on it. We'll just eat. Yeah. It's this place makes like, I don't know, when I when I go to this, when I go to this ramen shop, I'll take a picture and show it to you because I you get this like big bowl of ramen and it looks like if you were to go to an anime and like it's got all of the like toppings like in a circle around it and the broth and sitting in the broth and everything. And it just it looks as good as it tastes. And mm -hmm. anytime I have people come and visit me, I'm taking him there. <laughs> Well, we will have to remember that because we do plan on coming back to get going back to Gettysburg sometime in the relatively near future. Hmm. You know, there's nothing quite like uh, doing a stock art for a fantasy game and including a uh, baby doll. That doesn't make it creepy at all. Yeah, I don't think this one. This is. I don't think this is going to be a very creepy uh, doll, though. I just think baby dolls are creepy in general. Haven't you noticed I stick on like doll heads and uh, stuff like that into almost all my X crawl artwork? I know it doesn't make it any less creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Baby dolls are just. They give me the willies, man. Well, there. I think it's because I had this one from my mother who she cut the baby doll's hair uh, when she was like, I don't know, three or four or something. And she like cut this baby doll's hair and the baby doll is like super creepy looking anyway because it's like one of those like 1960s dolls that mm. are like big plush body and like, you know, kind of not not quite porcelain, but porcelain arms and feet and head. Oh, yeah. And so it's like, it's uncanny valley levels of creepy looking in the face in this, like, squishy body, like, beanbag body, and, like, hair that is just the worst kind of haircut you could ever imagine, because, you know, when you're two or three years old, you're kind of dumb, and you think, oh, yeah, I'll just cut my, my doll's hair, it'll grow back like my hair. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Um, Jess, I believe, uh, you have a story you can tell about that, about, uh, one of your dolls. There we go. Well, I'm trying to make her not look, this baby doll not look creepy. Well, you're doing a good job. Now it, now it looks a little dopey. <laughs> it's the big ears, I think. <laughs> What's that? I said it's looking a little dopey. I think it's because of the big ears <laughs> and the troll hair. Man, do you remember trolls? How oh, popular but... those things were? Whew. The fact that there's still a movie franchise for them? Oh, I forgot about that. Why'd you have to bring that to my memory? Oh, man, that's cursed. And I think it is, uh, oh, it is about that time. Okay. Well, folks, it has been fun. Next week, I will be more organized. Jess will probably have more excruciatingly bad jokes for you by that time. Since we've actually had uh, educational trivia this time, we'll have to bring the uh, tone of the uh, conversation down a few notches. And I will have more stuff for you to show you, uh, hopefully. But right now, it is time for Alana to get out of here so she can get ready for Ma of Mike with Manly Mike Curtis in approximately 15 minutes. So thank you for joining me with this evening, and I shall talk to you next week.